Welcome. Today is the 21st day of Av, the 25th of August, and we're starting a new Parsha, Parsha Re'e. Parsha Re'e starts out about choice, choice. And so it's not very surprising that choice is the motif that runs through the entire Parsha. Um, so let us see. It starts off by saying that Moses said to the people, See, I set before you today the blessing and the curse. The blessing to motivate you to heed the commandments of God your, and that I am commanding you today. And the curse if you will not heed the commandments of Havaya your God. But instead turn away from the path that I am commanding you. So what is he telling us? He, say, he says you have choice. You have to decide. You have to decide which way you want to go. And this is, when we talk about what is the essence of life? What is the essence of life? Why does the soul come down into the body? It's all about choice. Every single moment of our lives, we can exercise the greatest gift that God gave, which is choice. Free will. We have the ability to choose. And we have to choose correctly. But to mature, to truly mature, to truly understand the meaning of life is to understand that regardless of the circumstances, sometimes circumstances are better, sometimes they're worse, the entire point of the soul coming down into this world is in order to have choice, to have free will. And it is through that, through the choice, that we become eternal. And this is very interesting. This is a, a very important concept. The soul, for all its greatness, for all its being part of God, is still lacking something. And it's lacking the ability to know itself and the ability to know itself eternally. Not just in the sense of going through a phase of knowing itself and, 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 and that's over once you finish this lifetime. But rather, if a person chose and exercised this choice during his lifetime properly, the soul goes back to its source with that added element. And the choice becomes eternal. It becomes that from that moment on, the soul is not locked into its destiny anymore. It can actually continue to change and shift and grow and become more for eternity. So we see this very important concept here, which we'll see in a moment in the Parsha itself. But I want again to stress this, what this means again, that by exercising choice in a limited span of time, 70, 80, 90 years, the soul gains the power to continue to choose and grow for eternity. That's the great benefit of the soul coming down. That's why the soul is even willing to come down into this world. That's why each one of us in our core was willing to tolerate the difficulties of this lifetime in order to be faced with the opportunity of choosing between one option or another. And some people will say, there's always many options at every moment of life. And so that's what life boils down to choice. Now, let's turn to verse 5 in chapter, uh, chapter 12. What we are describing in the first reading is not just the choice, but also the fact that we should eradicate idolatry from the land of Canaan, from the land of Israel. Why is idolatry so problematic in the context of this Parsha? Because it leaves you without choices. Um, there are no options. There is only one way of doing things, there is only one correct answer, and so on and so forth. You're left without true options. Uh, sort of like a person who is coerced into following a certain plan of action. But the whole point of godliness, the whole point of serving God, is to be free. 
sages say this, There is no person who is free, rather the one who is engaged in Torah study. Because the Torah opens up the possibilities. Most importantly, the possibility of foregoing my survival, my necessities, my needs, and choosing to do something greater. That's the great thing that the Torah always gives us, this option to pursue godliness, which means to go beyond our physical needs, to go beyond even our spiritual needs, to sometimes even give up on those. For instance, when a person uh, is born, uh, he seems to have one life course, and then he gets married, and the life course changes. And even though the previous life course may have been more spiritual, at least theoretically, he chooses to live life with his spouse. The same thing happens when children are born. That you thought you had one life course and now it changes. And you have to choose this new direction that is given to you as a result of having children. And the person might say, I would have been better off, more spiritual, more intellectual, more whatever, without them. But my choice is to do something greater. My choice is to do something greater than being alone, than being just a husband and wife. I want to be a parent. I want to be a grandparent. I want to go beyond even my spiritual needs. So idolatry takes that away. We can't discuss exactly how it does that here, but idolatry always leaves you with the sense that you should be pursuing your basis, your basest needs. And the basis needs, especially in a world in which there's contraception, in which people don't even feel the need to get married because they can have free relationships without the commitment. So that takes away from choice. So in the land of Israel, you can't leave idolatry at all. That's what the first reading is about. And then it says that you have to serve, you have to bring sacrifices. So in verse 5 he says, Rather than having multiple sites of worship, you must direct your attention solely to the place that God will select from among all your tribes to which to attach His name. You must seek His presence and come only there to offer up your sacrifices. On the face of it, this is a limitation. Look, the idolaters, they can build an altar, they can build a temple for their idol, for their God, anywhere they want. But we have to do it in the place that God will select, the place that God will choose. Now, if the Torah would have, or God would have wanted there to be just one place, He would have said, here's the location. This is the location where you will be limited to serving me only there. But he doesn't phrase it that way. He says, the place that I will choose. Why? Why not just tell us? Where's this location? We all know it's in Jerusalem. But Jerusalem is not mentioned as the place that God will choose in the Pentateuch, in the Torah. It's not mentioned. Jerusalem's mentioned many times. But, and it was the seat of serving God for many generations from the descendants of Noah. That's where Shem, the son of Noah, set up his temple. That's where Jacob went to learn when he was leaving Beersheba in order to go to Haran to marry his wives there. It was always the seed of monotheism. There's nothing new about that. But the Torah doesn't tell us that. You, you could guess it from many other verses. But... It doesn't say it. It phrases it as the place that God will choose. Why? Because choice, like we said, is what reveals the universality of the divine presence. I want you to think about this a little bit. It's not, it's not so easy to get at first. But it's the same thing as what we describe about the soul coming down into the world in order to choose when God is able to choose, and He chooses a specific location, 
that location is not in order to say that God is here and he's not everywhere else, because that's nonsense. Of course God is everywhere. So why the choice? Because the choice acts to reveal that God is everywhere in the world. You need to have choice to expand. This is the idea behind choice. Choice is not the cho choice, it's not choosing what is obvious. It's choosing what is difficult. If there are no equal options, choice doesn't have any meaning. To put it another way, if the soul came down into the world and it was so clear that the one path that you have to follow is just to do what God said, and the other option of not doing what God said would be so clearly the poor choice leading to calamity after calamity, then what choice is there? There's no choice. The choice is what we call deciding on something in order to make that into the starting point, the inception from where you expand into everything else. When we talked about the soul, we said that we spend our lifetime choosing in order for the, for et for the soul to gain an eternity of choice. When it comes to the location of the temple, God chooses a location in order for the temple to become the beacon from which the entire world is illuminated by the revelation of God. And then God is revealed to be everywhere. But if you don't make that choice first, if you don't make this limit first, then you can't expand. The same thing is true about serving God. If you don't have limits, in other words, awe of God, a structure, a framework in which you're working, then you can't move on to loving God. There has to be awe before there's love. There has to be a choice before there's possibilities. There has to be choice before there's an expansion of that choice. And there has to be a temple before God can be revealed everywhere. And indeed, once the temple was built, we can build many synagogues. We can build many places to worship God, because He's everywhere. But we don't have the holiness yet without the act of choice, and God has to choose this. So God chose, for Him, all the world is the same. There's no difference. There's no difference between Jerusalem and anywhere else in Europe, or in Africa, or in the United States. There's no difference. But once God chooses and makes one place holy, then the holiness can spread out everywhere. And that's the whole point behind choice, to turn something that which is local into something that's non-local. Now, if you'll look, uh, hopefully on Tuesday, we should have the wonders out. We, uh, Rav Ginsburg connects this idea beautifully to physics, to modern physics today. Um, needs to be expanded even more in that direction, but I think you'll appreciate it. And to go out with this message, that the more we exercise our choice in life, and don't succumb to the circumstances, the more our soul gains the possibility of choosing for eternity, for all eternity, and even when it departs the body. So thank you very much for joining. I hope to see you tomorrow.